In this video, the problem of the one and the many, what that is and why we care about it. One of the reasons you can't really do theology without also doing philosophy is that you need to train your mind to think abstractly. You need to get your brain to be open to the transcendent, not just in the sense of memorizing and agreeing to the statements in the creed and the catechism, but to ponder them. It takes some t training to teach your mind to wonder about the world. That's because the average mind is wholly focused on practical things necessary to succeed in the workaday world. And because of this, people's wonder muscles have grown flabby. Heraclitus was awesome at wondering at the world. You can almost see him lost in the sense of wonderment here. He wondered deeply at how everything in this world was constantly changing and yet somehow, amidst that, things could mostly remain what they were. In fact, for the world to be intelligible at all, there must be a principle that holds things together at least, at least enough for things to make sense to us. He called this principle the Logos. Some church fathers thought that Heraclitus' idea of the Logos was a distant antecedent to Jesus Christ as the Logos of God revealed in the Gospel of John. But the main point here is that profound reflection on the nature of reality is a necessary precursor for us to really understand God and the world and that there is more, much more to the world than what our senses tell us. Parmenides likewise was a profound thinker who should inspire us to think more deeply on the problem of the one and the many. We probably shouldn't agree with Parmenides that there is only oneness and that manyness is an illusion. But we should agree that oneness and manyness is a difficult problem. Why, you ask, is it a problem that there are many things? Well, because for one thing, there must be something that unites the many things into one. But how do we know that? Why must there be a unifying principle that unites the diversity in the world into a unity? Here's where we have to think. Pink, pick any two things in the world. I don't know, a banana peel and a cell phone battery, a shoelace and a rail car coupling, a moon rock and a can of apple pie filling, the angel Gabriel and an ice cube. Any two things you want and compare them. What do they have in common? Nothing, you say. Such different things have nothing in common, Professor Shaw. Ah, but that's where you're wrong. Because if the things truly had nothing in common, it would be impossible to compare them at all. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to close your eyes and ponder that. Now you see that I'm right. The very fact that we can compare these wildly different things means they have to have at least something in common. Even if the only thing they share in common is that they are all things, they all exist. They may have nothing else in common except being itself. Parmenides was right on that point. Being is common to all things. They all exist. They are all things. That may be the only thing that everything has in common. That is, being a thing. But that is something. There's something else that all things have in common. They all have an essence. That is, something that makes them what they are, and by extension, makes them different 
from other kinds of things. So let's look at some examples. A tree. What is the essence of a tree? Well, a woody trunk, branches, a root structure, leaves or needles. We don't need to take this too literally, of course. We could imagine a tree that lacks leaves. But think of the essence as being what is essential, such that if it were lacking, we'd no longer have a tree anymore, but something else. If we removed what was really essential to the tree, part of its essence, we'd no longer have a tree, but a stump or some lumber or something made with the lumber like furniture or a house or a pile of wood chips or sawdust. Now the tree picture on my left, well, I don't know, it's only an image of a tree. I don't know if it still exists or not, but this tree does exist. It exists and has the tree essence, what makes it a tree and not something else. We could even think of the essence of what takes the existence, the existence that all things have, and channels that existence into this tree and keeps it as a tree and not something else. It's a limiting essence. If we lose something of that limiting, limiting essence, we lose the tree's existence as a tree as well. Come to think of it, it seems like just about everything in the world is like that. Is a delicate composition of existence plus a limiting essence. This coffee cup both exists and has the coffee cup essence. This apple exists and has the apple essence. This, I don't even know what this is. It's a random part of something or other. But hey, it exists and has the limiting essence of whatever it is. Now this delicate composition of existence and essence really does make sense of things. Because suppose we imagine the essence of something like a unicorn. Yeah, okay, it has the limiting essence, the horsey-like thing with the horn on its head and so forth but what, with, without the act of existence. Sorry, it's just not a thing. And yeah, I guess we can close our eyes and imagine existence without a limiting essence of any kind at all. So something that is, but exists as nothing in particular. Nice mental exercise, but that's not really a thing either. Being nothing in particular is basically being nothing at all. So we're making some progress here in solving the puzzle of the one and the many. The manyness of things comes from the many different limiting essences that make everything what it is. Well, the oneness, the oneness comes from the existence that all things have in common. But I wonder, are we sort of back to the change and permanence problem of Heraclitus here? I mean, where does the being that all things have in common, the being that unites all things, where does that being come from? One thing we can be sure of, the being cannot come from the things themselves. Because remember, everything we looked at was a composition, a composition of existence on the one hand and a limiting essence on the other. Everything that we considered earlier in this video trees, coffee cups, apples, all of these had a unique limiting essence. But here's the kicker. Existence was not part of the essence of any of them. I'll repeat. Existence was not a part of the essence of any of them. Existence is something added to their essences, something that makes them real things. And yet none of these things have to exist. We can imagine a world without trees coffee cups, apples, but all of them exist kind of gratuitously. And besides, they have not always existed in the past and will not always exist in the future. There was a time when this tree did not exist. And there probably will come a time when this tree is converted to wood chips, sawdust, or lumber. Its being is temporary and limited in a certain way, like its essence. Well, this of course brings up the question, the world seems full of things that do exist, but haven't always existed, and in fact, don't have to exist. So is there something that has to exist, who has existence as part of his essence, 
whose essence is to exist so that all other things can exist. A supreme being who is responsible for the existence that unifies all the other many things in the world. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. But welcome to philosophy and abstract thought. If you're taking this course for credit at CDU, or even if you're not, and you've made it this far through this video without falling asleep, congratulations. You have what it takes to study theology. And if your head is spinning, well, watch the video a few more times and pray for the, that sense of wonder, the sense of wonder needed to ponder the world abstractly, to see what, it, what holds it all together. And now you should see why we do philosophy for theology. The problem of the one and the many is one of many philosophical problems that have arisen down through the centuries. But if we give ourselves time to ponder it deeply, we'll see that it leads us on a path upward to God himself. Thank you.